All right, I remember coming home numerous times from elementary school crying because kids would make fun of me on the bus ride home. And I had glasses back then, and so they were this thick, and they would call me Four Eyes. Well, my last name is Asker, and it doesn't take much to make fun of that either. Brian, did you ask her? Did you ask her? My senior year of high school, my mom found a lump on her breast and was soon diagnosed with breast cancer and began regular chemo treatments, and she lost all of her hair. And she would get wiped out for days on end each time. It was also my senior year of high school that a friend of mine turned 18, got his pilot's license, and got a private airplane. And he took my youth pastor down to a funeral where he was going to be the pallbearer. Unfortunately, en route, the plane malfunctioned, and they both died in a plane accident. Recently, our adopted son, who's four years old, had to have two cavities filled. Our dentist said that it's likely that his mother was malnourished during his pregnancy. And as a community, we're experiencing corruption. This afternoon, our church will host a funeral of a young 19-year-old who passed away in a gun accident. That's not the way that life is supposed to be. In the news, we see things like the Tamir Rice case, the Oregon militia, Boko Haram, and North Korea, all signs of corruption. The world isn't the way it's supposed to be. It's not the way God designed it. It's corrupted. And corruption is the process by which something is changed from its original use or meaning to one that is regarded as erroneous or debased. In the beginning, God created this beautiful world that we have. But by Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, only seven generations into the world creation, God said, He saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Furthermore, in verse 11, he said, The Lord said, The earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence, and God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. The world was corrupt. It wasn't what it was intended for anymore. And in verse 14, God says to Noah, Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. And in verse 17, For behold, I will bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh in which is the breath of life under heaven. Thus begins one of the most famous stories in all of Scripture. Let's fast forward to our text today, chapter 7. If you want to turn in your Bibles and join me, we're going to begin in verse 11. In the sixth month, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. In the following verses, we see the extent and the details of the flood. Noah's three sons and their wives were on a boat, on an ark, and it rained for 40 days, covering the entire earth, including the mountains. And then down in verse 23, we see the summary of all that has happened. God blotted out everything, every living thing that was on the face of the ground, man and animals and creeping things and birds of the heavens, 
They were blotted out from the earth. Only Noah was left and those who were with him in the ark. The first thing that we see in our story here today is that God's word can be trusted. It was 120 years previous to this that God made his declaration that he would wipe out the earth in chapter 6. And you know what? He did it. He did what he said he was going to do. God keeps his promises. But if you're like me, you might be thinking, wait a second, this sounds really mean. Well, lest we think that God is just an angry God waiting to punish his people, let's remember that Scripture tells us numerous times, including most poignantly in our kids' Scripture memorization verse from this past week, Psalm 145, verse 8, that the Lord is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and rich in love. It was 120 years that God gave them after his declaration before he destroyed the earth. And God has promised us today that he is coming back. And when he does, he will rule and he will have his way. Everything will be right again. Some will perish, but some will inherit eternal life. We know that because God has promised that to us. In chapter 8, verse 1, we see God remembers Noah and all the beasts and all the livestock that were with him in the ark. And here we get a glimpse of God's mercy, God's love. You see, God could have wiped out him too. God could have wiped out Noah. Noah wasn't perfect. Lest you think that Noah saved himself by his own righteousness, this was something that was actually ascribed to him by God. As Jonathan Walton put it in the NIV application commentary, when the text identifies Noah as righteous, it does not imply that he deserves to be spared or that he has earned God's grace. It indicates rather that God takes careful note of righteousness and blamelessness. So we see here that it is part of God's character, his mercy, his love, that he chooses to save humans and all of the animals through one man, Noah. Through an ark, God chooses to save the entire human race. And today, God's mercy, God's love is available to us. Through one man, Jesus Christ, who was perfect but died on the cross on our behalf and offers eternal life to all who would believe in him. Now we get in the story some of the details of the water receding. The ark comes to rest on top of a great mountain. He sends out Noah sends out a raven and then two doves. He's testing the land out. And we find that in total, Noah has been on the ark for a grand total of 12 months and 11 days. That's crazy. And then in verse 17, God says, Bring out with you every living thing that is with you, all of the flesh, that they may swarm on the earth and be fruitful and multiply on the earth. The flood story here we see is a mirror image of the creation story. God completely destroys everything on the earth except what he commanded to go onto the ark. He starts over with the same mandate that we saw back in Genesis chapter 1, if you were with us when we did that study, be fruitful and multiply. And after the animals have left the ark, Noah builds an altar and offers a burnt offering in verse 21. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma, the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground because of man, 
For the intentions of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living creature as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And now we see. We see why the earth was corrupted back then and why it is corrupted today. The intention of every single human heart is evil from youth. Mine, yours, all of us. But we also see God's great compassion, his great love, despite knowing that we are all evil, despite knowing our state, God still promises that he will never again do this. As long as the earth remains, God always keeps his promises. He loves us. And so we see in this story that the main character is not Noah. Noah is a fairly flat character. He's never seen speaking anywhere in the story. God is the one who is commanding Noah to do these things, and Noah is obeying. And because of this, we see in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 7, that Noah is credited with righteousness. So let's take a look at the main character in this story. What do we learn about God and who he is? Well, we learn that God always keeps his promises. He saw the corruption in the world and promised to destroy it. And he did it. And don't we want him to destroy corruption? I do. But I don't want him to destroy me. We also learn that God has compassion, mercy, love. God is compassionate. He saves the entire human race and all of the animals through one human. And he promised that he would never again destroy the earth. One fascinating way that I have seen God's promises and his compassion in my life is through our adoption story. If you can believe it, one of the critical steps in our discernment process over whether or not we should adopt was watching the movie Despicable Me. (laughs) In the movie, Gru, the mastermind criminal, adopts three little girls. And my wife leaned over to me when we were watching the movie and said, I think we need to adopt three girls. (laughs) And I said, how about we start with one? (laughs) It was two and a half years later that we picked up our son in China, and he was wearing these. (laughs) You can't make that stuff up. And it demonstrated to me that God, who had told us that he wanted us to adopt, was with us. He always keeps his promises, and he loves us, and he will always be with me and our family as we follow him. God loves us. And I can tell you so many other ways that I have seen God's love in our adoption story. So what does this mean for us today? What is God's Love and the fact that he keeps his promises mean for us today. Well, we still live in a world of corruption. And the reality is that we all contribute to that corruption. In Genesis chapter 8, verse 22, God told us that our every intention is evil. But just as God made a way, made a way out of the destruction for Noah, He has made a way out of it for us. God sent his son 
to die on the cross on our behalf. We are corrupted. I am corrupted. But God is inviting us to follow him. We don't have to build an ark, but we do need to believe in him. And when Jesus was talking about Noah in Matthew chapter 24, he said, But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. God has promised us that he is coming back. Are you ready? Are you obeying his commands? Have you asked him to forgive you? God loves you. And he's slow to anger and abounding in love. He is not willing that any of us in here would perish. And so, he came down to earth. And he took on the death that we should. Do you want to experience his mercy? Are you following Jesus today? Would you like to begin that today? I would like to invite those of you who would like to do that today to pray. And so let's all bow our heads and pray. If that's you today, I want to invite you to talk to God and tell him you're sorry for the ways that you are corrupted. God, we admit that we are corrupted people and that we have been a part of corrupting your world. And then I want you to tell him that you believe in his son Jesus and his work on the cross and that you want to follow him. So God, we want that today. We want to believe that you indeed are the one man who was perfect, who offered yourself up as a sacrifice on the cross for us. And we want to follow you today. Would you help us to do that? If that's you, I would love to have you just raise your head up and make eye contact with me. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we ask that this would be true of us. Amen. So if that's true of you today, I want to invite you to come up afterwards and to meet with our prayer ministers and to be prayed for. But now, let's talk to those of us who are following Jesus. When the land was dry, God reminded Noah of the Genesis mandate, the creation story, to be fruitful and multiply, which is a precursor to the Great Commission that we find in Matthew chapter 28. In our church, we talk about that in terms of advancing his priorities both across the street and around the world. So, how are you advancing his priorities across the street and around the world? What's one thing that you could do this week to advance his priorities across the street. It could be as simple as inviting a neighbor to join you in something that you're already doing. Just this week, two of the students that are involved with InterVarsity invited their non-Christian neighbor, who happens to be from another country, to help them babysit our kids on Thursday night so that my wife and I could go see the movie Star Wars. Little did they know, little did she know, that my daughter would insist that they all join her for her nightly Bible study and prayer routine. I was so proud of our students and my daughter. 
Or it could mean asking someone if they are ready to follow Jesus. This fall, one of our students at the College of St. Scholastica, who had grown up in a family that told her, it's not okay to talk about your faith publicly, she took a risk. And she sat down with a friend of hers and shared the gospel story. And she invited her to follow Jesus. And she said, yes. What is he inviting you to do? Imagine if we were all advancing Christ's priorities across the street and around the world. I imagine that more people would know just how much God loves them and that they don't have to give in to the corruption of this world anymore. Next, we get to take communion. And I can't think of a better way, a better next step, than reflecting on what our Savior has done for us on the cross. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Son. Thank you that you came down, you lived among us, you identified with our corruption, corrupted world, you experienced it. And you chose to go to the cross and die in our place. Thank you, Lord, that you overcame death and that today we can experience new life with you. Help us to follow you and to do what you have commanded us to do. Amen.